welcome to Hope Church. We're so glad you are joining with us today. If you are new here or would like to find out more about our church, visit us at hopekansas.church. We believe God has something unique to say to you, and our hope is that you feel his love stronger today than ever before. Now, get ready for some heartfelt worship and a great message.
This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. Sing it out. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. We see you break down every wall. You want the giant.
As we enter the Christmas season, this morning's message won't really be a a Christmas message. Pastor Bobby will begin our Christmas series next week. Uh, This morning's sermon is more of a prequel to Christmas or a a background to the Christmas story. In fact, the truth of the message this morning uh, serves as a background to creation and all of God's interaction with humanity, uh, past, present, and future. And the truth is that God is love. Now, knowing God well, knowing God accurately, as he reveals himself to us, is absolutely essential to a right relationship with him, to understanding who he is, to understanding who he wants us to be and how he wants us to live. And nothing is more foundational or essential than rightly understanding the love of God. Understanding the love of God is often made more difficult for us because of the inconsistency of our experience with love. Our experience of of love in human relationships is uh, unfortunately uh, flawed and it can color our understanding and our expectations of, of God's love. For many, love is disappointing and um, it falls short of expectations. Um, it drives many to uh, continue looking for that perfect love or real love or true love or uh, what, what they're longing for but can't seem to find or uh, sometimes even really even define. But with continued disappointment, many uh, give up on the idea of true love or they view love as just inherently flawed and overhyped and sadly their understanding of God's love can also become flawed. But even in overwhelming disappointment, um, even if that's our only experience of love, we still have an innate longing to experience pure and real and unconditional love. No matter how disappointed we are by love, there's still this undeniable draw toward it. Even those who have given up on love can't escape this inner longing. And uh, that's simply because God is love and he created all of us with an inner desire and drive to know him, to experience him, to know and experience his perfect love. It's simply why we were made. But in this fallen and sinful world with all the influence of Satan, the deceiver who works to twist and distort all of the truths of God, and many look to fulfill this inner longing to experience God's love with all manner of other things and other experiences that uh, we call love or think of as love. And even as Christ followers who, who understand this truth, Uh, we we can often misunderstand the true nature, the true reality of of God's love. The Bible tells us that God left imprints of himself, evidences of his being throughout all of creation. He created all of us with aspects of his being, were created in his image. And though fallen and distorted by sin, God's plan is to perfect those images of himself himself in us uh, through through transforming us by the power of his spirit. His his goal is to... uh, perfect those images of himself in and through us. And as part of his imprint on us, we have the ability to love and be loved. 
our understanding and our ability to love, though, like all things, is marred and distorted by sin, by the deceptions of our enemy. So our experience of love in this fallen world is broken and disappointing. But God wants us to experience his perfect love. Our ability to love and be loved is ultimately fulfilled in a relationship with God, experience his, experiencing his perfect love, both loving and being loved by him. And as we experience his love, our ability to love is, is transformed and his love becomes reflected in our love for each other. So our ability to love and be loved is perfected as we experience the perfect love of God. However, as beings created with free will, we have the capacity to continue to selfishly misunderstand God's love, to selfishly uh, uh, view our, and have a concept of love. And we fail to live transformed by his love. And we fail to allow his love to be reflected in how we love others. And most often, this is simply a result of an improper understanding of the reality of God's love for us. When we misunderstand the reality, the full truth of God's love for us, it hampers our ability to love as he wants us to love it. it gives us this, we remain in this distorted view and understanding of love and what it means and how it means for us to live. Now, with all of uh, his attributes, God is perfect. And the same is true in the aspect of his love, that God is love and he is perfect in his love. And beyond what we can fully experience or even comprehend in this life. Now, let's look at what Paul says uh, in, as he, as he, in Ephesians as he prays for the church. He says in Ephesians 3, 14 to 19, When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through the Spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Understanding and experiencing the truth of God's love is essential to our faith, to essential to our Christianity, essential to us being the people that God wants us to be. And Paul prays here that we will have the power to understand how wide, how long, how high, how deep God's love is to, to, uh, to understand the enormity, the vastness of God's love, even though it's, he says it's too great for us to fully understand. He wants us to experience it. God understands how easily we misunderstand his love, and he inspires Paul to pray this prayer and write it in this letter so we all can know how important it is for us to gain a right understanding of the love of God. And why is this so important to God? Because as we understand and experience the fullness, the limitless love of God, we're made complete, as it says, with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Experiencing, having, being able to live in the fullness of life and power that comes from God hinges on our ability to understand, rightly understand, and experience the love of God. So God's love isn't like ours. We need to understand that. It's perfect. It's limitless. It's boundless. It's unconditional. And that last one is, I think, where most of us misunderstand the love of God the most, that God's love is unconditional. That means God loves everyone perfectly, and no conditions must be met or maintained to earn God's love. God loves everyone perfectly before they ever take their first breath. God loves everyone perfectly before they ever make a conscious decision. And here's the difficult one. God loves everyone perfectly after all of their conscious decisions. It's, it's easy for us to understand God loves everyone before they take their breath. God loves everyone before they make a conscious decision. It's those conscious decisions that we make that often cause us to, to misunderstand and feel like, well, God can't love us now or can't love us as much or can't love us whatever. But God loves everyone perfectly even after each and every one of their conscious decisions. His love is perfect. It's endless. It's simply who he is. And nothing we can do can turn it on or off. Look with me at 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 7. I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them. No, wait, who did he say? Pray for all people. All people. Not just people you like. Not just people that like you. Pray for all people. Ask God to help them. Intercede on their behalf. 
Give thanks for them. Now, often this is the way we pray for people that we love, people that we like, people we're friends with, people we have a relationship with. But God is telling us to extend that to all people. Ask God to help them, intercede on their behalf, give thanks for them. Verse 2, pray this way for kings and all who are in authority. Now, he, he, he picks a particular group of people here. He's like, okay, I told you to pray for all people. Kings and all who are in authority would be included in that. That should be obvious, but he, he specifies this group of people here because especially in this culture at this time, the, the, the government, the authorities, they weren't exactly a Christian friendly. And this is a, this is a group of people that the Holy Spirit and Paul understand that there's likely conflict with. There's likely contention between uh, those who are in authority, the government officials. But he says, pray this way. Pray that God will help them, intercede on their behalf, give thanks for them, for kings and all who are in authority. Why? So that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. So he says, for this group of people that you are likely to have conflict with, pray for them this way. Why? So that you cannot have conflict with them. Pray this way so that there won't be conflict, so that you'll live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. Verse 3, why? This is good. And pleases God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. He doesn't want us to be in conflict with everyone. He doesn't want us to see them as our enemies, those who oppose Christianity, those who try to restrict us, those who are different than us. He says, no, pray for them, live at peace with them, so that because God wants them to become saved and understand the truth. Verse 5, for there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus. Listen, Jesus is the only hope for those people. So God says, pray for them. Live at peace with them. Verse 6, he gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. This is the message God gave to the world at just the right time. And I have been chosen as a preacher and apostle to teach the Gentiles this message about faith and truth. I'm not exaggerating, just telling the truth. So God loves everyone, no matter who they are, no matter what. He wants everyone to be saved and understand the truth of his love for them. And notice that the Holy Spirit through Paul thinks it's important to point out that this is not an exaggeration of God's love. It's simply the truth. Now, it's very kind of counterintuitive to our experience of love. It's counter to how the world tells us love should work. It's counter to our experience of love in this life. But that's the beauty of the reality of God's love where Paul says, I want you to understand how massive it is, how the depth and height and the the enormity of God's love. And then in very practical ways, he, he points out the difference between human love and God's love. Listen, it's not, it's not loving like we think we should love. It's not loving like humanity thinks love should exist. But listen, pray for everyone. Pray for those you're likely having conflict with so that you can live without conflict, so that you can reveal to them godliness and God's love and so that they can come to understand the truth of God's love because Jesus died for everyone. And he wants everyone to experience his love and truth, even those who at this point hate him. He wants them to come to know him and his perfect love for them. And that's not an exaggeration. It's just simply the truth. The fact is God's love can't be exaggerated because it's already beyond our ability to understand. It's already bigger than what we can fully comprehend. But like God's wisdom, sometimes God's love doesn't make sense to us. It doesn't seem like he should love some people. But he does, and he loves them perfectly. And sadly, sometimes it it doesn't seem like God should love us. But he does, and he loves us perfectly. Look with me at Romans 5, 8 through 11. It says, But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemies... We will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because of our Lord Jesus, or because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. So while we were still God's enemies, Christ did this for us so that we could become his sons, his friends. And that's true for everyone who remains God's enemies. You see, there's nothing that you have done to earn God's love. God loved you when you were still his enemy, when you weren't even interested in doing anything to earn God's love. There was nothing anyone else can do or must do to earn God's love. God loves everyone perfectly. God's love can't be earned because it is simply who he is. He loves perfectly without conditions. God perfectly loves those who hate him. God perfectly loves those who live in sin. God perfectly loves 
those devoted to other religions. God perfectly loves those who reject all religion. God perfectly loves those that we don't think deserve it. God perfectly loves those who think and live differently than us. God perfectly loves those who believe differently than us, who value differently than us. God perfectly loves everyone who is completely unworthy of his love. And the fact is, that's all of us. Look with me at Colossians 1, 19 through 23. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence, and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. But you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. So before we could do anything to earn it, before we could even want to earn it, God loved us and did everything necessary to rescue us from our sin and change us from his enemies into his children, from slaves to sin to holy and blameless in Christ. God's love is freely given, offered unconditionally. And this pleases God. However, please notice and understand that experiencing God's love, receiving the benefits of God's love, remaining in God's love, that is conditional. To fully experience God's love, we must continue to believe it and accept it. We must initially believe it and accept it, and then we have to continue to believe it and accept it and stand firmly in it, as the word says here. It's possible to to drift away, to begin to believe the lies of the enemy, to believe that we are no longer worthy of God's love, that he couldn't possibly love us completely or perfectly or as he did before or as he loves others who we think are more worthy than we are. But God loves us perfectly unconditionally. All we must do is believe this truth and remain in it and continue to live in it. So it's offered unconditionally. It's offered freely. God loves everyone without them having to earn it, without you having to do anything to deserve it, without you having to do anything in exchange for it. It's freely given. But for us to remain in it, to fully experience it, to walk in it, we have to continue to believe in it and continue to stand firmly in it, to guard against the lies. We must work to understand more fully what it all really means. So we not only accept God's forgiveness, but we accept and work for his transformation as well. We accept and work, we accept and work for God to continually change us and make us more like Jesus. We can't continue to be enemies of God. We can't continue to misunderstand his love. We can't continue to fail to love as he loves. We can't continue in sin. Yes, we may still mess up. We may still sin. We may still love imperfectly. But God is always ready and willing to forgive us and help us when we are committed to working at living free from sin and living in his love. We can't be okay with it when we mess up. We can't be okay with it when we believe the lie of the enemy that God can't love us anymore. We can't be okay with it when we continue to love imperfectly. We can't be okay with it when we continue to see people as enemies that God is desperately longing to see come to to know him. We can't continue to live contrary to how his word calls us to live. We have to continually work to live in his love and reflect his love and how we love others. We can't do anything to earn God's love. We can't do anything to lose God's love. But we can drift away from it if we don't maintain a proper understanding of God's love. Now here I must be very careful to explain God's perfect love in light of the rest of his perfect character, especially God's perfect holiness. You see, too many times... uh, As believers, people have focused on one aspect of God over another, and that has distorted their understanding of God's character and God's nature. And that's perfectly um, possible when we're looking at the love of God or the holiness of God. But So we often uh, struggle to understand the, the coexistence of God's love and his perfect holiness. They're both perfect and both complete, and they're both um, in harmony. But often understanding or misunderstanding one skews or distorts the understanding of the other. And we have to understand the perfection and coexistence and equality of both God's love and his holiness. So while we can never do anything to change God's love for us, he can't change his perfect holiness either. So God's holiness, and he's perfect in his holiness, that really is the definition of that would be his perfect freedom from sin. Holiness in the Bible has really two aspects. It's complete freedom from sin and complete devotion uh, to the purpose of God. So God is perfectly free from sin and perfectly 
and holistically and always perfectly devoted to accomplishing his purpose. He can't be deterred. His mind doesn't change. He doesn't waffle. He doesn't shift. He's perfectly free from sin and perfectly devoted to accomplishing his purpose to redeem mankind. So because he is perfectly holy, no sin can exist in his presence. So while God's love provides for the forgiveness and redemption of everyone, for those who don't accept it, for those who don't remain in it, God's holiness prevents them from spending eternity with God in heaven. And these two things, understand, exist in perfect harmony. Hell, God's rejection of sinful people is not a result or a function of his personality. It's a result, it's a function of his perfection. When we sin, if we continue in sin, if we accept it, if we remain in it, God's holiness will prevent us from spending eternity with him in heaven. However, please never believe that because of your sin, God no longer loves you or no longer offers to rescue you from your sin. God's love remains perfect and constant and offered freely. And he wants to remove sin from you. He wants to remove you from slavery to sin so that you can be holy, so that you can live with him. But understand, we have to accept that. There's nothing you can do to earn it, but you can certainly reject it or stray and drift and walk away from it. But no matter what you've done, no matter how many times you've sinned, no matter how many times you've rejected God's love for you, you can't change or diminish his love for you. And if you return to his love, if you accept his forgiveness, if you accept his transformation, if you turn from sin, if you work to live in obedience to God and live in his love, you will experience and live in the fullness of his love for you. That's the fullness of the Christmas story. The coexistence and perfection of both God's love and his holiness. You see, God perfectly loves all sinful and fallen people. So he sent his son, the perfect expression of his love, to die as the perfect sacrifice to remove our sin and satisfy his holiness. To make us holy and able to experience the fullness of his love in this life and fullness of his presence in heaven. You see, that's the beauty, the coexistence, the harmony of both God's perfect love and his perfect holiness. Yes, he sent Jesus as an expression of his love, but he had to die and sacrifice himself to make us holy, to remove sin from us so that we can be made holy, so that we can experience all the fullness of who God is. You see, God's holiness requires that we be holy. No sin can exist, can exist in his presence. So because none of us can be holy, we've all sinned, God's love made a way to make us holy to remove sin from us, to take us out of our slavery to sin and make us the righteousness of Christ. That's the beauty of Christmas, the beauty of God's love and holiness together. And this beauty of the Christmas story must become the beauty of our very lives. Because God is holy, we must be holy. Because God is love, we must love others the same as he loves. Jesus says in John 15, 12 through 13, this is my commandment, not an option, not a suggestion, King of kings, Lord of lords, says, this is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. He says in Matthew 5, 43 through 48, you have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Oh, isn't that the belief of our society? Love those in your clan, love those like you, who believe like you and think like you and vote like you and hate everyone else because they're anyone who thinks or believes differently than you. It must be your enemy and must be destroyed. That's really the overwhelming message of our society right now. And Jesus says, you know, 2,000 years ago, you've heard the law that says love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Verse 44, but I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. Why? Because he loves everyone. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. But you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. So understand, Christ follower. If we as the church, if we as Christianity, if we as the people of God only love those who believe and think like us, that's not the love of God. Jesus says here, that's no different than how everybody else, that's just human love. That's not the enormity of God's love. We have to love those who hate us. We have to love our enemies. Notice how different God's love is than any other love you can find or experience anywhere in this life. And notice that God requires that we love differently as well. We must love as he loves. 
with God's love, with God's perfect love, without conditions and without limit. We must love even those who make themselves our enemies. We must sacrifice for the benefit of others. We must be willing to give of ourselves and all that we have for the benefit of others, especially to help them come to know and experience the love of God. 1 John three sixteen through 19. We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth so we will be confident when we stand before God. God loves you and everyone perfectly. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, God loves you perfectly. There is nothing you can do to change that. God will always love you perfectly. God's love is without condition. It can't be earned. It's yours because it's who he is. God's love made every sacrifice and is constantly working for your eternal good. All you must do is accept God's love and choose to live in God's love as he makes you able. That means you must love others as God loves them. No one is your enemy. No one is unworthy or undeserving of your love. You must love because God loves. No one needs to earn your love or meet any condition before you love them. You must be willing to sacrifice and work for the benefit of others simply because of your love, not for any gain or because they deserve it or because of what they can do for you. Even when they will return your love with hatred, we must be willing to sacrifice and work for the benefit of others and show God's love to them. God is love, and we must always work to be more like him, to love as he loves. We must be moved and motivated by the eternal fate of those around us. We must see that the holiness of God requires that those around us still trapped in sin will spend an eternity in hell. And we must be willing to sacrifice and work to help them see the love of God that sent Jesus to sacrifice and pay the price for them, to make them holy and acceptable, once again able to spend eternity with God in heaven and experience the fullness of his love. We can't hate those still trapped in sin. We can't set ourselves against them. We can't oppose them. We are to love as God loves, willing to work and sacrifice for their eternal benefit, to reveal to them the fullness of the truth of God's holiness and his love. We are called to even greater expressions of love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. To give up our lives for them, to give to those who are in need, to serve each other, to work and sacrifice for the spiritual growth of others. This is how we must view Christmas. This is how we must live Christmas. In the beauty of the truth of the Christmas story, the perfection and the coexistence of God's love and his holiness. Now please understand, there's a lot of Politics, there's a lot of thoughts, there's a lot of opinions about Christmas in our society today. And if you want to choose to not shop at a particular store because they sell holiday trees instead of Christmas trees or won't allow their employees to say Merry Christmas and, and you disagree with how they do things, listen, that's okay. It's okay to really to disagree with people. It's okay to disagree with people who want to deny the truth of Christmas, of Christmas that Christ is coming to earth. It's okay to disagree with their distortions of the truth about God and the reality of Christmas. But please understand, neither God nor Christmas need any of us to defend them. Rather, God wants us to live in the beauty of the truth of Christmas, to communicate God's perfect love because of the truth of his perfect holiness, understanding that people who reject him and continue to live outside of his love must spend an eternity away from God in hell. And that must motivate us through God's love to to communicate that love and that truth to them. You see, understand, if if Christians won all of their political and cultural battles, people without Jesus will still die and go to hell, even if they're saying Merry Christmas. You see, we can't get uh, distorted in our priorities. We can't allow our differences of opinion or belief to become more important than sharing the truth of God's amazing love to those around us. We must not fight the fights that the world wants us to fight. Instead, we must share the love God wants them to come to know and experience, his perfect love. Let me say that again. We must not fight the fights the world wants us to fight. Understand, that doesn't mean we believe what they believe. It doesn't mean we give in to what they... Listen, understand, we believe what the Bible says, but we don't fight the fight they're trying to get us to fight. Instead, we share the love that God wants them to know and experience, his perfect love. 
So we must ask ourselves this morning, do I love as God loves? Am I loving as God loves? What am I doing to help someone experience the beauty and the wonder of Christmas? What am I doing to help someone else come to know God? What am I doing to help someone else grow in their relationship with God? What am I doing to serve others and make apparent God's love for them? Who have I set myself against? Who have I who am I viewing as my enemy? Who have I deemed unworthy of God's love and my love? Where has my love and my understanding of God's love fallen short? Maybe this morning you're that person who's struggling to believe God can love you because of what you've done. But understand, God loves you perfectly, unconditionally. Accept his love this morning. Commit to living in his love and holiness with his help. Maybe you're the person struggling to answer another of those questions. What am I doing to help someone come to know God? What am I doing to help someone grow in their relationship with God? What am I doing to serve others and make God's love apparent to them? And if you're struggling to find an answer, you need to consider God's love for you and his command to love as he loves. God loves you perfectly, unconditionally. Even when you misunderstand his love and mess it up, he wants to change you with his love and help you love as he loves. If you'll come to him, if you'll admit where you've been wrong, if you'll accept his love and forgiveness and commit to living in his love and holiness with his help. God loves you perfectly, unconditionally. He wants to help you experience his love more and more. And as you do, as the first scripture we read says, he wants to fill you with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. That too is one of the beautiful aspects of the Christmas story. God's willing to go to any length necessary to help you live with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. And that comes through understanding and experiencing and living in and choosing to live in the fullness of his perfect love. You pray with me this morning. Father, thank you so much for how much you love us, more than we can comprehend. Thank you for sending your son as an expression of your love, but also the perfect expression of your holiness. Thank you for how those two aspects of you exist in perfect balance. Lord, help us not to misunderstand or believe or fall into the distortions of the enemy. Lord, help us to understand once again this morning the fullness of your love, the perfection of your love. Help us, as the word says, to understand as all Christians should, how wide and how high and how deep and how long the enormity of your love, even though it's too much for us to comprehend, Lord, let us experience your love. Lord, and let it change us. Correct our misunderstandings. And Lord, help us to live in your love. Not stray away from it, not believe that you can't love us, not believe that you can't love us as much as you once did, or not believe that you can't love us as much as someone else, to believe that we haven't earned it. Lord, help us to understand your perfect, unconditional love. Help us to accept it. Help us to live and walk in it. Lord, this Christmas season, let us be great and wonderful communicators of the truth of your love and holiness the beauty of this Christmas season. Help us to accept your forgiveness. Help us to accept your transformation. Help us not continue to live in our misunderstandings, in our sin, in our failure to love as you love. But help us for those that we have been in opposition with, for those that, Lord, we have set up as our enemies or accepted as our enemies, those who hate us and mistreat us or whatever it is, Lord, help us to love them as you love. Lord, and that begins, as your word tells us, to praying for them, interceding on their behalf, asking you to bless them, asking you to help them come to know the wonder and truth of your love. Lord, so to all of those that we're in conflict with, those that we deem unworthy, those that we see as your enemies, our enemies, Lord, all those things, Lord, soften our hearts to them. Help us to see them as you do. Help us to understand your love for them. But God, help them come to know the truth and the wonder of this Christmas season that you love them and you've done everything you have you can to rescue them and you offer it freely and unconditionally Father help us to communicate rightly your love to them Lord help us the rest of this Christmas season to be bright lights of your true and real love to those around us help us to experience and walk in your love Lord in your name we pray Amen Thank you so much for joining us today. If you would like to respond to today's service or would like prayer, head over to our website at hopekansas.church and click the Let's Chat button. We'd love to hear from you. Have a great week. 
we've set up a simple way for you to give to our church online. If you want to give a quick gift, enter an amount, select a fund, then enter your email address and your first and last name. Then enter your payment details and click Give. And that's it. We'll send a receipt to your email address. To use a saved payment method or manage a recurring donation, you'll want to log in. Click the Login button and we'll send a code to your phone or email account. Verify the code and you're in. Now your payment info is ready to go when you want to make a donation. To manage your giving details, switch over to the My Giving page. Here you'll see more ways you can give. You can also add a payment method, a bank account or a debit card, set up a recurring donation, and view your giving history.